Greetings this morning, and what a beautiful day it is to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti. Pastor Keith, and welcome this morning from home and from afar. Let us begin on this Transfiguration Sunday with our opening prayer. For, O God, in the transfiguration of your Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith. By the witness of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice from the cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your children. Make us with Christ, heirs of your glory, and bring us to enjoy its fullness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This Wednesday begins the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday, a time in the life of the church to reflect upon Jesus' path to the cross. During this time, we understand what Jesus went through to accomplish salvation for us. The knowledge of his saving work for us is brilliantly displayed in the empty tomb and resurrection. Or as one child in Sunday school spoke of the resurrection, Easter is when the stone was rolled away from the tomb. Jesus came out, saw his shadow, and we had six more weeks of winter. For truly, it is a frigid time this time of year. But as I begin this reading from the Gospel of Mark, we find ourselves moving from chapter 1 in that baptism right into the middle of Mark in chapter 9 of the 16 chapters. Jesus has just talked about for the first time, the foreshadowing of his death in Jerusalem, and the disciples cannot hear the words. So we come to the transfiguration, the revealing, the pulling back of the veil that is upon Jesus to show God's glory. And this marks the beginning of the season of Lent, that we know the glory of Jesus as we now learn about his ministry as we head towards Jerusalem So let me begin in the first verse of chapter 9. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God comes with power. Let us now learn about that power of which he speaks. For it says, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, 
one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were ter- they did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's sermon is titled, Coming into Focus, to see the glory of Jesus. Thirty-four years ago today, today, we've talked about that before, we live as Christians in today. So 34 years ago today, I heard a sermon, and I began to follow Jesus. Certainly I'd heard sermons before as a child and as a youth, but it never struck into my heart and mind together at once. It took a few more weeks, though, after I heard that sermon before I joined by reaffirmation of faith on Palm Sunday. And I heard that sermon on that Transfiguration Sunday at the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. There it sits on the corner of 73rd and Madison Avenue in New York City. Across the corner is the headquarters of Ralph Lauren. On the other corner used to be a fancy store called the Sharper Image. Or as one of my teachers one time told me who was visiting, what an incongruous place to put a church. Albeit it had been there for 150 years. That day I heard a sermon and I became a Christian. There was no bolt from the blue. There was no vision. I saw nothing. But I heard God speak. And what I later read... It was a very mundane words, but God spoke, and I listened, and I changed. As an aside, the connection to that church runs right into our sanctuary. The opening introit was written by John Weaver. He was the music director at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, and I got to know John and his two children as I led the youth group, Carrie Ann, who's now the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Ithaca, New York, and his son Jonathan, who went on to West Point and served in Iraq and Afghanistan until he was sadly killed by a drunk driver about 10 years ago. But John was a bohemian, a fun guy. His office was filled with Lionel trains, and he went on to the kingdom of God about 10 weeks ago. The connection to us, as I've written on Facebook, was Our organ project, as many of you know, had come up short with the first builder, and we were wondering whether we should even continue. I called John to ask in his retirement after a year there, hey, could you look at our stop list and give us some advice? He says, well, I'm not really doing much. I'd be glad to look it over. I have jury duty. Give me something to do. And he looked it over and sent back a lot of annotation notes. And Gordon McQueer, now in Topeka, looked through him and said, how wonderful. Do you think he might help a little more? And so I called him. And they said, well, he can't help you right now. I called the church, and even though he retired, they said, well, he's not available right now. He's rehearsing the children's choir. And you have to understand, John was the chaired professor at Juilliard and the Curtis Institute, been a music director for 35 years, And what was he doing on a Wednesday afternoon? He was rehearsing the children's choir. Well, he flew with us to St. Louis and Canandaigua, New York, and the hills of Tennessee to visit organ builders, helped us pick Martin Ott, helped design the console, Mary Jean Sitset, help came in and made sure the organ sounded the way an organ's supposed to sound, bright and full and clouded at times. And of course, he delighted us with that inaugural Sunday presentation of the instrument back in 2009. Just some thoughts I have on this day. When I first heard a sermon and began to follow Jesus and the people I've met along the way, 
Today's passage is one of the most remarkable moments recorded in the Gospels. Jesus has taken Peter, James, and John on retreat. In the midst of that, they have a mountaintop experience. While Jesus is in prayer, the three disciples doze. As Jesus draws near to his Father, he is transfigured. Well, what does that mean? Well, it turns out the word transfigured is the word from which metamorphosis comes. Mark says, his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. It's as though all exterior barriers to Jesus' identity have fallen away as he radiates the presence of God. The transfiguration is seen as an epiphany, a vision of light, the penultimate only to the resurrection, a moment in which Jesus' divine nature is unveiled. Let's not miss something else here. Jesus is in prayer as this transformation takes place. Prayer is a lifeline for our identity as children of God and one of the touchstones of faith throughout the Gospels. Even as Peter speaks, a cloud suddenly overshadows them. This is the glory of God. It is from this cloud that God led the children of Israel to freedom from slavery. By this cloud, God obscured Pharaoh's approaching chariots. From this cloud, God spoke first to the children of Israel and later to Moses to give them the law. This is the cloud that descended upon the tent of the meeting each time Moses went in to intercede with God on the people's behalf. This cloud will continue to appear in Jesus' life. It will fill the earth with the darkness of Good Friday. It will bear him away at the ascension. We are told it will usher him back at his return. They are fully in the presence of the Most High God who speaks this recurring message. This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. That word was first heard on the lips of the prophet Isaiah, and it was spoken at Jesus' baptism. Now this bolt from the blue, this unveiling will change them. From time to time, God's glory appears in our lives, in nature, on a retreat, during a worship service, an anthem, even a sermon. Yet it comes on God's schedule, not our own, and it is always fleeting. But it always has a purpose. It comes as a mean of pushing us forward into times of walking in a new way with Jesus of Nazareth. Words of power, words of truth. They were spoken by a 76-year-old preacher in a dimly lit, dark wooded sanctuary to a self-conscious young man wondering if there is community, a place where people are served without first serving themselves wondering if this God in Christ has, is really just a bigot keeping us trapped, wondering if the church is a place of empty words without any power to heal. The glory that was revealed as a foretaste to Peter, James, and John was released that Easter day, and it's now available for all who will look, for all who will listen, for all who will respond. We no longer live in a world where God's glory is veiled. God has revealed it all to all who will receive it. The Christian gospel is about the power of God to transform us. This, says Paul, is the mystery as well as the glory of the good news. That same power which is present in Jesus is now present in us to transform our lives as well. Paul says we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another by the power of God's Spirit. We are being turned into the name we bear, Christian, being made into little Christs. And now, listen carefully, it is something done to us. And like all lasting transformations, it is a slow process, slow even imperceptible. 
but joined to Jesus Christ in baptism and nurtured by him at his table, listening for him as we read scripture, connecting to ourselves through him in prayer, looking for him in the varied places of our lives. We are called less to struggle with the world around us than to embrace him where we see him, listen to him where we hear him, follow him, trusting his victory over evil and death to be our source of victory as well. And as that happens, we are changed. It is true that as we seek to follow, we will be challenged. His ways are not the world's ways, but as we allow ourselves to be challenged by his word, as we open ourselves to his presence, we discover his power changing us. At first reading, it seems that no apparent transformation took place in Peter, James, or John that mountaintop day. We easily slide back into old habits and patterns after such events. For instance, they dozed again while Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. They ran in fear at the trial and abandoned him at the crucifixion. But Christ would not, did not, abandon them. And that is the point. And this is the good news for each of us. As we look to Jesus, as we follow him, we are looking and following none other than the God-made flesh, the one in whom God's glory is present as faithfully as if there were a reflection there in the mirror. And as we look and follow, we are being transformed by God's Spirit from one degree of glory to another. For the day is coming, as surely as Easter is the culmination of Lent, when we will find ourselves raised into the presence of the risen Lord, and we too shall be like him. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let our hearts be connected in prayer this morning. In the face of Jesus Christ, the wondrous will of God is revealed. The God of glory transformed this world. Gracious Lord, we pray for your church, for the First Presbyterian Church of Ypsilanti, chartered in 1829, being a light unto the neighbors and our city, serving meals, sending forth missionaries, ordaining pastors, blessing the children and teaching the adults. May we be a community that welcomes and transforms. God of all glory, transform this world. We pray for your broader and wider church from the capital cities to the smallest of villages, the humble houses and back rooms. People sing praises in your name, and they seek to walk in your way, humbly, gently, and strongly and boldly in the power of your spirit. So equip your ministers for leadership, your people as followers, that they may work in tandem together. God of glory, transform this world. We pray for our national and world governments that they would be just, that they would do the will of the people and seek the common good. Help us find unity of purpose around protecting those who are frail and vulnerable for those who cannot have speak for themselves to listen Make us a teachable people that we can learn from our past mistakes, that we can walk in higher realms with you. God of glory, transform this world. We pray for unity as it was the will of your son. Let us pray for unity of peoples and cultures and faiths around the world made in one image of humanity. Help us find what is common, and from there, build a strong bridge of hope towards the future. God of glory, transform this world. On this Valentine's Day, where people celebrate love and family and covenant promises one to another, we pray that they may be true that they may be faithful for those who seek that love or who have a broken or hurting heart this day. Remind them, breathe on them in tenderness that you were with them. God of glory, transform this world. I pray for the saints, for those that have gone on before us and taught us the faith, for pastors and organists, music directors and singers and teachers, for those that lead VBSs over the years, who do quiet works of mending and fixing. God of glory, transform this world. For those who have heavy hearts at the loss of a loved one, for Mary Ann Weaver at the loss of her husband and Kyrie Ann of a father, for my sister at the loss of a husband, for you all who have lost loved ones this year and in past years, help them be in the comfort of God. God of glory, transform this world. Here is Jesus. We pray with a humble heart for all who you have given to us in mind and in love. For parents and grandparents, for children and grandchildren, for neighbors, mentors, dearest friends, for those who have shaped us and challenged us, to continue to walk in your way. God of glory, transform this world. Holy One, as you are well pleased with Christ, help us to live in a way that will be pleasing to you. 
as you have called us to listen to Christ. Help us always to heed his word and seek his will. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May our hearts be united in the prayer of the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let me share in this moment two announcements. The first is please join us for our congregational meeting at 11 a.m. on Zoom. You'll find the link in the emails from earlier this week. And be present. The second one is on Wednesday at noon. I have a brief service of Ash Wednesday. That announcement was given out yesterday. I will repeat it tomorrow or today. Um, join me for a brief service of prayer and reflection on Ash Wednesday. That's this Wednesday at noon. Same place on Facebook Live. Blessings. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. For God has a purpose in our being there. And Christ, who dwells in us, has something he wants to do through us. Where we are right now, go forth in the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen.